Cosmological parameters uh, now come with error bars that are actually small. So this is a list of some of the cosmological parameters just to remind you. And the omega zero is the ratio of the determined um, energy density of the universe to the so-called critical density of general relativity. And that's the believe these numbers are going to be a percent. Uh, these are the different numbers that come from cosmological analysis for energy and the matter and the contribution of anything else. Uh, Hubble constants known as the sort of 2% level. It seems the age of the universe is known to uh, at least more precision. This and new parameters the number of uh, light between species and big bang coincidence. This is where a lot of uh, tests of um, cosmology come from. So these are all impressive numbers. Know, a lot of that information comes from the precision measurements of the cosmic microwave background radiation using the visible neutral ratio of the C of the temperature fluctuations. And if you take the uh, angular power spectrum plot as a function of multiple moment, you get very well known pictures of the uh, relative intensity of the fluctuations. One as a function of L uh, and uh, you know, extending out to L is 3,000. Uh, that line that fits all of this data in this thing here uh, with the um, microwave background fluctuations. And it's where this is the piece of data that trends a lot. Shocking thing that um, only happened in the last decade or so is this discovery of the accelerated expansion of the universe. This, of course, goes exactly the direction you wouldn't have expected. You would have expected, uh, loosely speaking, that of the clump and the slow down the uh, expansion of the universe when it goes to the direction. And by now, uh, the uh, later verifications of this initial measurement uh, uh, survived by Sweden. This is the Nobel Prize a couple years ago, I think. And the 
Seven by energy. So, uh, 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 Michael Turner would say, this is a uh, big deal. Uh, what is this stuff? Uh, what could be causing the dark energy? There are some uh, ideas. I'll just very quickly look at a couple of them. Uh, but of course, the, the attitude we should take is to try to search for it. Uh, and I'm not sure if uh, everybody knows about the US politics, but for those who do, the, uh, <laughs> 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 the attitude is, uh, is clear. So, uh, uh, what could it be? Um, uh, the most conservative assumption is that, is that the term that Einstein famously threw away, the so called cosmological constant. Uh, in other words, that something is allowed uh, extension of general relativity. Uh, and as a few pointed out, that term uh, uh, gets a contribution from vacuum fluctuations of fields of the particles we know and love. And so, uh, Sort of, if you calculate that in principle from our, uh, uh, our theories of nuclear particle physics, uh, uh, there's a problem though when that calculation is done that you may know. Uh, if you add up the zero point energy density of all the fields that are in the um, uh, and the interval, of course, it converges, but even if you cut it off in the most uh, conservative way, you will get a number for vacuum energy density, which is orders and orders of magnitude greater than the number that comes from the cosmological measurements. And I don't know, it's maybe 10 to the 70, 10 to the 50, 10 to the 100, depending on which fields you take. Uh, and I guess the most dramatic way to say it is that it's the largest non-infinite discrepancy between theory and starting theory. Um, also, just a quick reminder of what uh, this business of the vacuum energy does. I mean, you can do a very simple and almost thermodynamic analysis of it. I just take the first law of thermodynamics, and I assume the vacuum, the start energy, is uh, the ground state of some quantum field, and that ground state has no entropy, so I don't have a TDS term here. And if I simply put in that this energy is the vacuum energy density of the and I can see that. There's a relationship between the vacuum energy density and the pressure. And there's a negative sign here. And as you, if you look at Peter's equations for the energy momentum tensor of fluids in general fluid, uh, you know, uh, the speaking of pressure gravitates. So um, this um, P equals minus rho relationship between the pressure and the energy density leads to a bigger number inside that equation. And so uh, you can get an extension of it. So that's, the, that's one solution to dark energy systems, say it's Einstein's term. Uh, but we have this 10 to the 80 discrepancy between theory and Sarah, so maybe that's wrong. So what, could, what else could it be? Uh, uh, if, if you have to, if you want to construct a model to the dark energy, you have to add something to your freedom if, if you're not going to have it be uh, lack of energy. And so people have thought about how to add such a degree of freedom. Uh, there are a lot of constraints. Uh, actually, here's the talk maybe has a wax on them, actually, depending on how those measurements go. Uh, but if you try to mess with gravity, uh, as you know, there are many precision tests that bring different uh, uh, scales. Uh, and then there are people who have tried to come up with ideas to uh, modify gravity. The common theme of these ideas is they need some kind of screening of the effects that doesn't show up in a lot of precision tests, but still in, in empty regions of space can, can, uh, uh, can exist and cause the accelerated expansion. Uh, so uh, if you take, uh, so the universal uh, assumption. Theorists is always to imagine a scalar field because a scalar field can have 
quantum numbers in a vacuum since it has no spin. So you uh, imagine adding the degree of freedom as a scale of field, uh, couple that somehow to the energy density, and then uh, if you write the equations for the fluctuations of this field in, uh, in, in the presence of this matter, um, you'll get uh, an equation that's got uh, sort of the speed of sound Fluctuations. If the field has a finite mass, uh, um, you get the m squared term that comes from uh, Klein Gordon equation. And then on the right hand side, you have a source term, uh, which uh, you assume some sort of coupling. And I'm sorry, 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 i the so-called chameleon theories, and that's what I'll talk about a little bit now, is they try to construct a, uh, a, a nonlinear coupling of this field in such a way that the field has an effective mass which uh, uh, gets very small and therefore can create dark energy if you're in vacuum. But if you're in a high density situation, range of this interaction becomes very short and therefore evades all the tests. So that's the dirty trick, and that's why it's called a chameleon. Uh, it hides it now. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's just uh, the way So people have constructed such actions to try to make action of matter which we don't have this property. And there are ways to construct such uh, uh, an action. And as I said, you, you end up getting a situation where you've got an effective mass, uh, and therefore an effective range of this scalar field, which uh, depends on the course of secondary potentials usually in this, this, um, this nonlinear term. So to figure out how this uh, scalar field depends uh, in a particular situation and actually solve the differential equation to see uh, how it depends on distance. But generally speaking, uh, it will uh, be a very short range when the density of matter is high and a very long range for the vacuum. And so there's uh, various kinds of Nonlinear potentials you can put in to try to make this happen. And there are some constraints already in the parameters that you don't uh, uh, violate various precision tests of gravity that already exist. So, what does all this have to do with neutron interferometry? <laughs> so, let me say a little bit about what neutron interferometry is. Uh, if you had a um, gradual quantum mechanics test by a guy named Sakurai. In some part of Sakurai, he shows the picture of the experimental evidence for gravitational phase shifts of neutrons uh, in the gravitational field. And that experiment was done by devices like this. So, what these uh, interferometers are is they're perfect silicon crystals. And what you do is you sculpt away pieces of the crystal to leave. Perfect crystals whose lattice planes are aligned perfectly. And therefore, what you can do is use those lattice planes as coherent beam splitters and recombiners for neutrons. So a neutron can come in and uh, meet the diffraction condition in one lattice plane here. So part of the beam will go straight, part will be diffracted. And if the lattice planes line up properly, then you can still meet the coherent beam splitting condition here as well. And so you can coherently split and recombine the beam and make the neutron neutron. So that's what these devices are. And uh, this is just a uh, picture of the facility in this. Um, what's not shown, of course, is the nuclear reactor that's over here that makes the neutrons. Um, uh, the facility is actually a fascinating uh, 
vibration, isolation engineering object. So uh, this uh, facility has a 20-ton hunk of concrete which sits on air pads and is levitated. And then on top of that 20-ton hunk of concrete, there is a one-ton granite table, which is also on air springs. And inside a thermally acoustically shielded room, there sits a small crystal that fits in the room. So this object is very well vibrationized, and it has to be because uh, the neutrons are coming in slow, and the crystal moves by more than a fraction of the lattice position during the motion of the neutrons, so it moves in the but if you can meet that condition, then uh, uh, the interferometer works in the usual way of coherently spinning, slowly recombining the beam. Uh, so, for example, if you put a piece of matter in one of the arms of the interferometer, that matter will make a phase shift of the forward neutron wave going through it, and that phase shift can be measured with this uh, crystal. So um, uh, that's the uh, main application of this device, is to measure such precision relations. Uh, we have used this device actually in the past uh, to do nuclear fuel physics. And the point is simply that um, if you put uh, uh, gas samples of hydrogen, deuterium, helium, in this interferometer, you can measure with very high precision, and by high precision, I mean three digits, the coherence scattering length, and therefore the uh, SLA field scattering length, which nuclear fuel is can try to use to constrain the nuclear force. So that's uh, one application that uh, we made with this device that is associated with nuclear physics. And this is just Give you a clear picture of how this experiment works. This is the top view of the beam diffracting on the blade of the perfect crystal, taking its two paths, uh, and with the experiments I just mentioned, we had a vacuum chamber which, in which one uh, uh, area was evacuated and the other was filled with the gas of interest. This is an actual picture of the device where we see the perfect crystal, the two neutron detectors. The two places where the interfering beams can go, and you can see the beam. And that's a picture of the sample cell we used for these measurements. So, what we want to do is uh, exploit the fact that if this star energy exists, it will couple to the neutron. The neutron is too small to kill the community field. And so if I have a vacuum chamber with a bunch of walls, the walls are a source of the community field in principle. If I, that uh, chamber is evacuated to a very low pressure, the community field will blow out and occupy the space. But if I fill it with gas, the community field will, will collapse and only um, extend a very small distance away. So our idea is to um, uh, search for these communities by uh, doing an experiment like that. So we uh, intend then to construct a device in which we put this kind of crystal neutron interferometer, the entire thing, in a vacuum. So I've got the interferometer in a vacuum. On one of the paths of this beam, we will put a uh, source of high density like lead, like a lead tube around one of the beam arms. So that uh, lead will be a source of the community field that's closest to the beam. And then, uh, if there were this dark energy contribution affecting the neutron, the uh, beam that goes close to the lead will couple to that field and make a phase shift. And then, if we fill this uh, vacuum chamber with gas, that will kill the chameleon field, but give the same phase shift for the two parts of the beam. So, if I take the difference between these two measurements, uh, I should be able 
can see this. It's being revealed. And so uh, this is actually a calculation of the phase shift that the chameleon field will give to a slow neutron uh, in this experiment as a function of the pressure of the gas. And uh, they, what they did was they solved the nonlinear equation, which uh, determines the spatial uh, distribution of that field. And um, they, these are for different assumptions of the um, nonlinear uh, potential that's needed to, to generate the field for different ends. So uh, there is, of course, some model dependence on prediction. One, though, is that um, by uh, changing the pressure, we have a specific prediction for how uh, that phase shift can change. And um, it turns out, uh, according to the dark matter theorists who speak with us, that this technique uh, is one of the most sensitive ways to search for these community fields. So this is a plot existing constraints, uh, these are laboratory constraints on this idea. Uh, the regime here is uh, excluded by the well-known precision gravity experiments at the University of Washington where they have these torsion balances and very carefully measure uh, gravitational interaction. And then in this other uh, stronger, nonlinear coupling regime is the down and it's projected by our experiment from the neutron. And uh, as it turns out, this uh, um, uh, chameleon idea has, of course, been extended by the theorists to um, uh, to couple have co couplings to photons as opposed to the addition to matter couplings. And this is a recent plot of the various pieces of parameter space that have been excluded by experiments so far. And the things in Covered, uh, so collider data, torsion, pendula, precision gravity measurements, and slow neutron measurements. Uh, and this experiment, um, uh, this is this is existing for soon to be taken data, and then these other lines are extensions in based on other types of measurements. And so the neutron interferometry measurement. Better is pushing this direction. Uh, the point, I guess, of this plot is that it's, you can imagine the possibility that this is a theory we can kill. And so we made a proposal to build this neutron neutron uh, facility to conduct this measurement, and we're prepared for that. So I think uh, that's. So what I'd like to conclude is that uh, dark energy is a, a, a great history with its origins. Um, the most conservative assumption uh, theoretical calculation gives us something that's wildly different from what we observe. So maybe we should have some theories which uh, are not similar to that energy density coming from that direction. The great majority of the theories, unfortunately, Difficult to test in the laboratory, with the exception of this idea of a nonlinear stable field coupled to local energy And um, it turns out that slow neutrons are a very sensitive way to search for the possibility of such a field. And uh, I guess the attitude I would take towards this work is that um, uh, I think dark energy is so interesting. Kill an interesting idea with a laboratory experiment, you should probably try to do it. Are there any questions or comments for So, my is is the fact, is it because of the nonlinear coupling of the mass density that the neutron is too small to hide the chameleon? Yes. Energy? I mean, uh, why is it why is it too small? It's it's too small because um, there, there's a length scale involved in the theory 
degree. So if you take the dark energy density and do mean dimensional analysis and convert it into a distance scale, that distance scale is approximately 100 microns. So uh, it, since the neutron is, and that, that dimension is the plus and mean parameters uh, of the theory. And so the neutron is so much smaller than that, that smallest light scale of the field. It's an advantage of being small.